every now and then there's a research paper that comes along where I read the title and I think, that's gotta be fake. That's what happened this month when I saw this paper from Illy, Paulin and Fries, claiming to have found candidate supermassive dark stars in JWST data. A hypothetical type of star that's powered by dark matter that can outshine an entire galaxy. And when I first read the abstract, it just sounded so insanely sci-fi with all of the right buzzwords dropped in that my first thought was, Surely not. But this paper is in a legitimate journal, and if the findings are true, then it would help to solve some of the biggest mysteries in astrophysics right now. Like, for example, that JWST has found overmassive galaxies in the universe, and what could seed the formation of supermassive black holes in the universe. But we'll get to that. First, let's start with this idea of a dark star. Now, this has nothing to do with black holes. The term dark star was first used by John Mitchell in 1783, who mused on the idea of an object so massive that its gravity would be so strong that light couldn't escape, which today we know as black holes. If you want more info on all of that, you can check out my book, A Brief History of Black Holes, which is also out in paperback on the 21st of September. Instead, the term dark star here in this research paper is a star powered by dark matter. Matter that doesn't interact with light, but does with gravity so that we still know that it's there even though we can't see it. Now, I've made a video before on all the evidence we have for dark matter, but also on alternate theories of gravity that don't need dark matter in the universe to work if you want to check those videos out. Now, this idea of a dark matter star was first published by the same group of researchers back in 2008. Instead of being powered like normal stars, which use nuclear fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium atoms to produce light and heat, these stars are instead powered by something called dark matter annihilation. This is when a particle collides with its antiparticle. And when they meet, they turn back into pure energy via E equals mc squared. We can actually produce antiparticles, like for example, antiprotons or even positrons, which are anti-electrons. And we've actually observed the energy that is emitted when the two meet and annihilate. Again, I've made a video all about antimatter on my trip to CERN a few years ago, if you want to check that out. Now, if dark matter exists, as we think it does in our current best model of the universe, we still don't know what it's made of. There's been ideas knocking around that dark matter could even just be tiny black holes that pervade the entire universe, but the leading idea is that dark matter is some form of particle that the particle physicists haven't quite worked out what it is yet, but they are working on it. But the thing is, if we don't know what dark matter particle is, we don't know what an anti-dark matter particle is either. But in the leading dark matter hypothesis known as WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs are their own antiparticles and so annihilate when the two meet. Now, people have considered before if dark matter is indeed these weakly interacting massive particles, these WIMPs, then could we actually see the energy given out by this annihilation in places in the universe where the dark matter concentration is dense enough that you'd have enough particles there so that they would collide and meet, like for example in our galaxy's centre, the centre of the Milky Way. And this is something that the Fermi Telescope Collaboration are looking out for, and they've found a few candidate signals. But there's lots of debate over whether those detections are actually significant or whether they're just like systematics in the data. So something else that's interfering with your data and isn't a real signal. So jury's still out on that one, but people are trying to see if they can detect this dark matter annihilation signal somewhere in the universe. But another place that Freeze and collaborators argue that this annihilation could happen is in the much denser early universe. If you have a clump of mostly hydrogen and helium gas around about one to ten times the mass of the sun in the early universe, and just 0.1% of that clump was dark matter, then the dark matter would be dense enough to 
annihilate and it would produce energy which would then heat that surrounding hydrogen and helium gas. Giving the molecules of that gas heat would mean they would have enough energy to resist gravity pulling inwards on themselves and so it would never get dense enough to actually kickstart nuclear fusion and form a normal star. Instead you'd have something that was glowing because of the energy given off by dark matter annihilation and also because the hydrogen and helium gas around it was hot. But then, of course, you've now got a, a very big clump of gas that isn't collapsing to form stars, but instead then starts to bring in more gas from the surrounding regions under gravity. It starts to accrete more material to it, more hydrogen and helium, but also more dark matter as well. And so then it can start to grow very quickly, in fact, up to around about 10,000 times the mass of the sun. And at that point, it becomes so bright due to that annihilation and the heating of the surrounding gas that it can outshine an entire galaxy of normal stars. At least that's what this research group claims that you get when you run the maths. A supermassive dark matter star. Now, as far as I can tell, it is only this research group that has worked on this hypothesis of dark matter stars. There's been no other independent studies done. It's incredibly niche, which is probably why I'd never even heard of this idea of a dark matter star before this research paper came out. And I guess it explains why my brain was just like, no, it's too sci-fi. It's got to be fake. Plus, you know, I've just seen far too many fake JWST results pop up to last a lifetime. And speaking of JWST, if like me, you do get frustrated with the amount of, you know, false claims that are knocking around online around JWST, then let me introduce you to our sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is the brainchild of former NASA aerospace engineer Harleen Kaur. She created this app and website that combines thousands of articles around the world so that we can compare coverage and see things like political affiliation, who owns the publication, and how factual their reporting practices are. For example, when I search JWST on the website, we can see almost 300 stories were published on it in the last three months, primarily from center and left-leaning sources. Let's look at this story on the most distant active supermassive black hole ever detected. We can see there's over 40 sources reporting on it. The majority are owned by media conglomerates and they're mostly coming from highly factual sources. I love how you can skim through all the headlines in one place so that you can really see how the media is shaping public opinion. And I think that's incredibly important for other science topics too, like climate change, for which the science reporting is heavily skewed depending on the funding source and political bias of the media outlet. So to become a smarter news consumer, head to ground.news forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And if you sign up before the 31st of August, you'll get 30% off unlimited access to all the features I just showed you. So thank you so much again to Ground News for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to how do you even find find a supermassive dark star candidate like Illy, Pollen and Freeze have claimed to do this month. Well, this is something that this research group considered way back in 2012, a few years after proposing these hypothetical dark matter stars, stating that JWST would be capable of doing this once it was launched. First, they considered what the spectrum of light would look like from one of these dark matter stars. So that's a trace of how much light at each wavelength or color that you're receiving. Now, these stars are glowing because of how hot the surrounding hydrogen and helium is as it's heated by the energy released by the dark matter annihilation. So they're mostly described as what's known as a black body. A continuous emission of light, the shape and peak of which is related to just the temperature of the object alone. But since you've also got hydrogen and helium there, those atoms and molecules can actually steal away very specific wavelengths of light that are unique to those elements. And so you also end up with this pattern of sharp dips in the spectrum of light. You've also got this big drop off in the light, which is actually caused by more absorption, this time by hydrogen in the rest of the universe as the light from this supermassive dark star travels through the universe and passes through all this hydrogen. Because the universe is expanding, the spectrum gets stretched to longer and longer wavelengths all the time. And so you get this continuous absorption at this wavelength that hydrogen likes to steal light away at. So there's then two ways you can study this with JWST. You can take a spectrum directly with JWST 
XT. Split the light through a prism into its component wavelengths and see if that trace matches what you would expect. But also you can study this with just images from JWST as well, which are much easier to get your hands on. And what you do there is use filters that only let light through at certain wavelengths to make these images. And you can see that drop off because you detect light in one filter, but not the next. But also you can test what is the ratio of the brightness of the images taken through different filters. And does that ratio of brightness match what you would expect from the black body radiation? So in 2012, Ilian collaborators calculated JWST would have the sense sensitivity to do this and that if supermassive dark stars existed, JWST should be able to find around about 1 to 30 of them. Fast forward now to 2023 and the publication of this paper from Curtis Lake and collaborators. The first to actually look at spectra of galaxies from JWST to work out the red shifts i.e. how much the light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe, therefore how long must it have been traveling through the universe for, and therefore how far away is that galaxy. I actually covered this in one of my Night Sky News, the monthly space news recap series that I do back in December 2022 when the paper first popped up online. Now they found four objects with much larger redshifts than had ever been seen before, meaning the light has been traveling a long time through the universe and we're seeing these galaxies as they were when the universe universe was just around 300 to 500 million years old. Now Curtis Lake and collaborators identified these objects as galaxies of stars. As you'd expect, galaxies of stars are the only things we've ever observed in the universe that would be bright enough to see at those incredible distances. But Illy, Pauline and Freeze have now claimed that three of four of these galaxies could also be explained by a supermassive dark star model instead. Now, I expected Illy, Pauline and Freeze to grab these JWST spectra and compare it to the spectrum that they would predict for a supermassive dark star. But instead, they've actually used the imaging data from JWST instead, which is nowhere near as precise. I don't know why. Perhaps that is because the spectroscopic data hadn't been made public yet, so they couldn't get their hands on it. And maybe they're intending to do that in the future. Who knows? But for now, here's what they've found with the JWST images and where their claim comes from. Now, you can first see the different JWST filters at the bottom. They let in certain ranges of light when you take an image. Now, each of those filters has a corresponding black JWST data point on this plot, which shows the brightness in that filter for this object, Jades Z13. The green dash line marks that drop off due to absorption by hydrogen in the universe that lets you pinpoint the actual redshift and how long the light's been traveling. The blue line is a model spectrum of a supermassive dark star that best fits the data in black. And then the red squares are the model brightnesses that you'd expect in these JWST filters. So that's for one object. Here's that same graph for the other two objects as well, Jades-Z12 and Jades-Z11. And in each of these cases, Illy, Pauline and Freeze are claiming that the supermassive dark star model fits really well and these might not be galaxies like we first assumed. So why is this such a big deal? You know, beyond the fact that this would be a whole new type of star that we never knew existed if you believe the claims in this research paper. Well, the very first stars to have formed in the universe will have been responsible for turning the universe from opaque to transparent in a process known as reionization. When after 150 million years of the universe's existence, light could travel freely through the universe for the very first time. I knew I missed one. <laughs> Let there be light. Now, if supermassive dark stars existed in the early universe, then they could have been responsible for this reionization process. The most likely candidate, however, are what's known as population three stars. Essentially, the first generation of stars formed in the universe and one of the things that JWST is actually searching for. You know, they would be stars, but formed from pure hydrogen and helium gas, that only when they went supernova, they would produce the heavier elements for the first time, and then the next generation of stars would form from that sort of polluted gas with those heavier elements, and then so on and so forth, until all those heavy elements could then clump together to make planets and light. Now, thankfully, a galaxy of solely just these population three stars would look very different to a single supermassive dark star. Instead of absorption by hydrogen in helium, you get 
a mission as well. Population three stars are actually hot enough to heat any surrounding hydrogen and helium gas to such extreme temperatures that not only do they absorb the light, but they re-emit it at that very specific wavelength as well. So that in a spectrum, you would see this as a pattern of very sharp bumps in the light and not dips. Now, just a side note, we already have had claims that JWST has spotted population three stars. This paper still is in the referee stages for now, though, so, you know, going through all that peer review process, you know, to check its due diligence. Um, so once that's happened, I will cover it on this channel in a few weeks or months time. But it is one of the reasons that I'd hope this paper from Illy Pollen and freeze would have looked at the spectral data, not just the imaging data. And I think if they had made this claim with spectral data, not just imaging data, then I think that would have been a much stronger statement, one that I would have been more inclined to believe at this stage. Although just looking at the spectrum of these objects published by Curtis Lake and collaborators, it's very noisy. And I'm sure the data analysis is an absolute headache. For example, like, is this two absorption lines here or one emission line, you know, in amongst all of this noise? I'm sure that analysis is coming though, even if it is sort of slowly but surely as they deal with that incredibly noisy data, especially because Illy Pollen and Freeze actually identified a helium absorption feature that they say would be the smoking gun, the definitive feature to differentiate a galaxy from a supermassive dark star. So it'd be really interesting to see if that feature is identified in the future in JWST data, but also if any other research groups pick up on this idea of supermassive dark stars, which have remained fairly niche until now, unlike population three stars, which a lot more people are working on. I think it is a really intriguing idea, especially to someone like me who studies supermassive black holes and more specifically, how did they grow to be so supermassive? And I do cover this more in my book, again, if you want to grab a copy. But this idea of a supermassive dark star means that, you know, when all of the dark matter is used up, when all of it has annihilated and there's no process producing that energy anymore, then the whole thing will collapse into a ready-made supermassive black hole, as opposed to the only other way that we know to make a black hole, which is when a star, not a normal star, just runs out of fuel, goes supernova, and the core collapses into a piddly black hole, only, you know, around about five to a hundred times the mass of the sun. And then you've got to grow that from there by this process of bringing in more material to a supermassive black hole. So it definitely helps solve that problem. So this research paper, although it covers a very niche idea and requires a lot of assumptions about dark matter to get those models of what the light would look like, it is still an intriguing idea, especially with how many problems in astrophysics it would help solve right now. But you know, we always knew that these first few years after JWST's launch were gonna be interesting and that JWST data was gonna throw some curveballs at us that we weren't expecting. So who knows, maybe supermassive dark matter stars might just be one of those curveballs. Stars powered by dark matter that could outshine an entire galaxy. And I read that and it just sounded so insanely sci-fi that sci-fi, sci-fi? Sci-fi. Stars powered by dark matter that can outshine an in... I need to shut that window light could travel freely through the universe for the first time. Well, there were so many fizz and fizz in that sentence. I don't think I got them all quite right. <laughs> Do that one again. We need like a new version of the Muse song now if these things exist, right? Super massive dark star. <laughs> dark matter annihilating in the dead of night and the super massive dark star is reionizing. The rolls off the tongue, see Muse. There you go. <laughs> I've written the lyrics for you. 